In 2016, the Dead Rising series, which had begun with a hit Xbox 360 title 10 years earlier, lumbered to a halt with Dead Rising 4, a game which divided audiences. While it received mixed reviews from critics, fans were noticeably less charitable. Complaints were commonly levelled at its writing, visuals, technical issues, lack of interactivity in its environments compared to previous games, and its removal of a series staple, the timer mechanic. Rumours of a Dead Rising 5 began to fly through throughout 2017, but no such project ever surfaced. One year later, the developer behind the Dead Rising sequels, Capcom Vancouver, was shut down in September 2018. Fans and commentators could only speculate as to what happened, wondering what the studio had been working on and what role Dead Rising 4 might have played in the Vancouver studio's demise. To find the answers to these questions and more, I interviewed a multitude of staff who were a part of Capcom Vancouver throughout its years of operation. In this episode of Game History Secrets, I will be revealing the truth behind Dead Rising 4's troubled development, the Dead Rising 5 that once could have been, and the many other games that were lost along the way. The story of Capcom Vancouver begins in 2010. After the successful release of Dead Rising 2, Capcom acquired the studio behind it, Blue Castle Games, in September of that year. The developers had exceeded Capcom's expectations, navigating the challenges of a Western sequel to a Japanese game to find financial success and a generally positive response from audiences. In the months after its launch, the newly christened Capcom Vancouver would formulate plans for a Dead Rising 2 side story and an original IP they hoped to be published by their new parent company. This highly secretive project existed under the codename Brazil. It was an open-world third-person shooter that took place in a feature Rio de Janeiro, which had become infested with parasitic alien lifeforms. The player would have to do what they can to survive, carefully managing their sparse resources and blasting aliens with high-tech weaponry. Its developers described it as an intently slow-paced experience where methodical play was essential to success. The title would become engulfed in an executive-level creative conflict as the months went by, however. Staff were unable to agree over fundamental aspects of its gameplay, such as pacing. Brazil was worked on for close to two years before these disagreements over its direction would contribute to its downfall. Capcom shut it down in 2012 and funneled its staff onto Dead Rising 3, which was already well into development and facing problems of its own. Dead Rising 3 originally was being developed for both Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. It was planned to release in the twilight years of the two consoles, but the game was beset by technical issues linked primarily to the PS3 version, former developers say. Capcom Vancouver's staff were often left scratching their heads at the PS3's notoriously complex architecture, and this resulted in builds for that platform running terribly. The development environment of the PS3 was causing such problems for the team that some were staring down the possibility of cancelling the entire project. Although it's important to note that these issues weren't limited to that one platform. Its developers told me that the project was pushing ideas that were above the technical capabilities of 360 and PS3 alike. A seamless open world sans loading screens and a focus on combo vehicles that allowed you to plough through a higher number of zombies than ever before were among its lofty aspirations. With technical issues in abundance, Dead Rising 3 faced a real risk of never seeing the light of day. Fortunately for the Vancouver studio, Capcom was approached by Microsoft, who was looking to invest in exclusive content for their next console, the Xbox One. Microsoft broached an exclusivity deal for Dead Rising 3 to launch only on Xbox One, and in return, the project was injected with additional funding, an increased marketing budget, and a much needed extra year in development. It would now launch alongside the Xbox One in November 2013 with Microsoft mandated Kinect and Smart Glass features. Capcom's initial DLC plans for Dead Rising 3 were rewritten as a result too. Originally, a DLC prequel story was planned. This would have been followed by three epilogue chapters, with each one centering around a different Dead Rising protagonist, starting with Frank West, then Chuck Green, and finally Nick Ramos. 
These were eventually reworked into a series of small vignettes about minor characters from the game's main story made on a significantly smaller budget. Dead Rising 3 on Xbox One was not without its share of technical issues, but the additional power of the new hardware allowed the project heads to realise a lot of their ambitions with fewer performance problems. But that was not the only major project Capcom Vancouver had been developing throughout 2013. An original title named New Frontier had also been in the pipeline, beginning at the start of the year. This sci-fi themed space exploration title had emerged as the frontrunner from months of internal pitches designed to invent a new IP for Capcom. Intended as an open world action RPG, New Frontier was said to have been heavy on melee combat and pitted the player against various space pirates and alien creatures. Former developers described the game as Destiny Before Destiny, a reference not necessarily to its gameplay, but its themes of discovering worlds rich with lost alien technology. It was intended to have a distinctly irreverent, swashbuckling feel to it, likened by some to the TV show Firefly. Six months were spent developing a vertical slice for the game, when Capcom decided against moving forward with it around the launch of Dead Rising 3 in late 2013. Sources close to the project say that Capcom Capcom was unwilling to invest in fully developing this ambitious new property, which would have been costly to produce. In the months that followed, change was in the air at Capcom Vancouver. Its original president and founder, Rob Barrett, stepped down from his position. In his absence, the executive staff who had led Dead Rising 3 would become integral figures in the company's direction for the subsequent months. While downloadable content for Dead Rising 3 was wrapping up, they began mapping out plans for their next major undertaking. The partnership between Capcom Vancouver and Microsoft had proven fruitful and was therefore set to continue. Not only was Dead Rising 3 moderately successful, but Microsoft's original agreement with Capcom had included a right of first refusal that now tied them inextricably to the feature of the franchise. In other words, if Capcom was to produce another Dead Rising title, Microsoft would be offered at first exclusively for their platforms of choice. This time, as another Dead Rising title was being planned, Microsoft was a part of the project from the outset. The executives of Capcom Vancouver reportedly entered discussions with key members of Microsoft, and it wasn't long before a radically different direction was settled upon for this next Dead Rising. In the months leading up to these talks, Microsoft had been searching to add an exclusive survival game to their portfolio in order to compete with Sony's 2013 critical darling The Last of Us. Sources from Capcom Vancouver indicate that Microsoft approached the studio's executive staff with the idea of them helming such a project. Allegedly, the two parties enthusiastically agreed that this quote-unquote Last of Us killer would be a full reboot of Dead Rising for Xbox One. Executive producer Josh Bridge, the creative lead on Dead Rising 3, was now set to head up this planned game that was codenamed Climber. This moniker was derived from the codename for Dead Rising 3, which was Walker. Although, Capcom Vancouver's staff was still referring to it as Dead Rising 4, and this was the title that was apparently shared with Capcom Japan as well. In order to understand the events that transpired from this juncture, it's important to understand the apparently unconventional dynamic that was at play between Capcom Japan and Vancouver. Multiple former employees claimed that the Japanese headquarters maintained a somewhat distant relationship with their Canadian counterparts, having little to no direct oversight of their staff on the day to day and checking in with them only occasionally. At this point, Capcom was placing a high level of trust in the management of the Vancouver branch as communication between the two was allegedly minimal. It was in this gulf of silence and unchecked creative freedom that the stage would be set for a disaster. Climber was worked on over the course of several months in mid-2014 by the vast majority of Capcom Vancouver's staff. This large team spent millions of dollars developing an elaborate prototype that presented a total reimagining of the Dead Rising series. It was an open world survival game with a focus on stealth gameplay, which included sneaking up behind zombies and quietly executing them. Its new direction was far more subdued, moving away from the comedic antics of its predecessors. Its tone and visual style were darker, grittier. Crafting and comboing items together was still possible, although weapons were now far more grounded in reality. 
This new vision was lending inspiration from popular zombie media at the time, like The Walking Dead, but was also a manifestation of the studio's strong desire to create something different and more serious. Having worked on Dead Rising for a number of years, and being repeatedly denied the opportunity to do anything else, their creatives channeled a lot of this energy into Climber. The result was unlike anything Dead Rising had done before, which was a problem. Sources who were a part of the Climber project alleged that while Microsoft had been kept in the loop, Capcom Japan was never properly informed of this direction for the entire duration of its development. In mid-2014, Vancouver's execs allegedly presented the game to a stunned audience of Capcom higher-ups, who were apparently less than pleased at their creation, to put it lightly. A former staffer offered their interpretation of Capcom's revulsion towards Climber. The brand of Dead Rising is not as malleable as Capcom Vancouver thought it was. I think they realise that it's not in the DNA of the series. Rebooting it that way is just going to make it align with all the other serious zombie titles that are out there, and it's going to make it conflict with what the fun of Dead Rising is, which is doing stupid shit to zombies. What followed was a near total restart of Dead Rising 4. Between Vancouver's heads, Capcom Japan and Microsoft, a far safer approach was quietly agreed upon for the project to adopt. Vancouver's execs, including Josh Bridge, reportedly pitched bringing back Frank West, setting the game in Willamette at Christmas time, and implementing combo mechs. This more conventional proposal, which brought back a fan favourite, received the green light, and so the Dead Rising 4 that fans noticed today was born. The Vancouver studio had to now pivot towards making a completely different game, and very little could be salvaged from the months spent on Climber. To make matters worse, this new Dead Rising 4 had to be made from the remaining time and budget that Climber had initially been allocated. When all was said and done, around six months had been utterly wasted, leaving only a year and a half to finish Dead Rising 4. Capcom ultimately decided to clean house in October 2014, allegedly firing the executive staff that had been deemed responsible for the failings of Climber. Among them were a number of key employees who had been instrumental in the making of Dead Rising 3, including executive producer Josh Bridge, senior producer Mike Jones, and design director Jason Lee. Former developers claim that faith in the studio was dwindling at this point. The fallout from Climber had taken its toll, and the rebooted Dead Rising 4 was left rudderless without its original creative leads at the helm. The walls of Capcom Vancouver were a buzz of speculation that the project would be cancelled, and the offices could be closed entirely. Consequently, a mass exodus took place throughout the remainder of 2014, with an alleged 40% of the studio's workforce leaving, including numerous Dead Rising series veterans. Adding to these woes were a series of unsuccessful pitches submitted from their developers throughout 2013 and 14, including various reimaginings of classic Capcom franchises. One such project was codenamed Rex, short for Resident Evil X, an action-driven spin-off of the horror series. The publisher rejected it, as the public was souring on the more action-oriented RE games like Resident Evil 6. The Vancouver branch then attempted to revive survival horror series Dino Crisis with a new game for modern hardware. This endeavour never advanced beyond the pitching phase, being shot down by Capcom Japan after a few months of work. Developers believed that they were unwilling to make the significant investment in new technology that the project would have required. Internal pitches are also said to have existed for a new Onimusha game and a side-scrolling adventure using the Mega Man IP. With none of these secondary endeavours receiving the green light, Capcom Vancouver's focus was instead placed squarely on Dead Rising 4. Sources say that a new studio director, Joe Nichols, helped to hone the direction of the company to a degree, but the team continued to hemorrhage talent as development went on. January 2015, for instance, saw the departure of longtime series writer Annie Reed, who the company scrambled to replace and whose work on the game was largely reiterated over. Dead Rising 4 received no shortage of complaints when it was eventually released, with many fans citing missing features from previous games. Many of these 
these omissions, former Capcom members explained, can be rationalised by understanding that the vast majority of work on the game's narrative and mission design was done under an incredibly condensed schedule of between 12 to 18 months. Within that deeply constrained development, the creative direction of Dead Rising 4 meandered considerably. Sources claim that a flavour of the week design culture took hold of the project, whereby the executives in charge would have the team ape features from other popular games they had taken a liking to. A key example of this is the camera filter system that had Frank scanning his environment for clues, which was directly inspired by the investigation mode in Batman Arkham Asylum. The team pitched expanding this feature by having it tie into the game's world in a more meaningful way. There were considerations for having different camera filters that would allow the player to access new areas a la Metroid, but none of these ideas made it into the finished game. Psychopaths, which had served as boss encounters in each game before it, were controversially missing from Dead Rising 4, but were considered early on. In the first internal demo produced for the game, the developers included a psychopath named Reindeer Man. Shortly thereafter, concerns arose that having psychos would be deemed inappropriate for having the player beat up characters with mental and physical disabilities. The final nail in the coffin for these villains, however, was the lack of time and budget needed to implement them. Developers say that the psychos from previous games were expensive to produce, requiring their own custom behaviours, animations, music and cinematics. The decision to cut psychos was partly walked back on the advice of a passionate few members of the team who insisted that fans would care if they were left out. As a compromise, maniacs were added midway into development, a series of basic mini-bosses made on a fraction of the budget. Another hotly contested addition to the game was the exosuit, a mechanical suit of armour Frank could occasionally equip that powered him up, allowing him to wail on enemies with great ease. Sources say that after it was originally pitched to the two publishing parties as comboing yourself, Microsoft became attached to the concept of Frank donning the exosuit and wanted it as a back of the box selling point. Some developers however were less than enthusiastic about this new mechanic, which they had inherited from the previous executive staff prior to their removal. The exosuit the suit was this terrible idea, everyone hated it, one member of the team said. It was a very bad decision that we got stuck with and there wasn't enough confidence in the team's relationship with the publisher and Capcom Japan for us to push back and say, this sucks. The game's Evo zombies were a similar situation. This ferocious new enemy type that ran about and jumped on walls was apparently lamented by much of the team, but Microsoft had taken a liking to them and thus they were committed to including them. The Evo Zombies were once intended to play a larger role in the story, originally being produced by a villain named the Evo Queen. This narrative element was cut early on due to time constraints, something that would become a running theme throughout development. Multiple Endings, another series staple, also fell victim to the short development cycle. A number of developers had proposed ways to implement this feature, but ultimately the game wasn't going to have enough content to support more than one ending due to the limitations presented. By extension, this is also partly why the timer was never a part of the game, due to the budget restricting enough content to justify one, in addition to most of the design team not liking the idea and the publishers believing it would limit its appeal to a broader audience. Yet another scrapped concept was serial killers. Players were once intended to encounter crime scenes unrelated to the main story as they explored Willamette. The developers wanted to have Frank scanning for clues and following trails of victims to eventually unmask the perpetrators. These side stories were left on the cutting room floor, again because of time and budget restrictions. The aforementioned constraints placed upon Dead Rising 4 would become a defining trait of its development and a constant barrier to adding substance to the title. Even with Microsoft ultimately granting them several more months, pushing it back from its initial deadline of summer 2016, its developers describe a frantic dev cycle where crunch time was common and creative freedom was sparse. The team was often left beholden to a plan laid out by a group of executive staff that had since been fired. It felt like we were in inheriting someone else's mess that we had to clean up, we couldn't invest the amount of time and effort into it to make it the product we wanted because we had this accelerated timeline, one developer said. By all accounts, many people on the project were of the belief that what was being made was of a lesser quality. Another source admitted, We knew the game was going to be bad while working on it, the ambitions for it were simply too big for the development length. 
One apparent casualty of the rush development was the game's writing. Former developers recalled the game's story scribes having little time to iterate upon dialogue or plot elements, negatively impacting its script and depiction of key characters like Frank West. Nobody on the team went out there trying to make Frank a sarcastic dickhead. The problem was that everything was written at such a breakneck pace, but we didn't have enough time to fix it. Even with clear issues mounting on Dead Rising 4, the front franchise was showing no signs of slowing its expansion at Capcom Vancouver. Sources state that preliminary conceptualization for a Dead Rising 5 was already underway in early 2015 among a small team, just several months into work on the rebooted Dead Rising 4. By all accounts, most of 2015 was spent experimenting with tech for the project, and it wasn't until early 2016 that it would find its footing, when months before Dead Rising 4 was even announced, Capcom Vancouver was hiring a completely new team for Dead Rising 5. This new game, initially led by a former Crystal Dynamics executive, was distancing itself from the previous instalment in about as definitive a manner as possible. At the time, the team was made up of 100% new blood, with zero cross crossover from the rest of the company. It was even being made in a different part of the Vancouver building, separate from the other project, and almost nobody from Dead Rising 5 had tried its then-in-development counterpart. On top of that, Dead Rising 5 was using a new engine, Unreal Engine 4, retiring Capcom's proprietary Forge engine, which had powered the series since Dead Rising 2. The introduction of Unreal offered many new possibilities, which the developers were keen to take advantage of. A core part of their vision at this early stage was the idea of being able to combo together practically any configuration of items to make weapons, which Unreal could combine procedurally. Other early considerations for the project included light RPG mechanics, whereby elemental effects, like burn or force damage, could be applied to weapons depending upon which items were mixed together. There were also new options for traps. More or less any item, such as a chainsaw, could be affixed to walls or floors to create hazards for enemies. On the other hand, switching to Unreal Engine 4 presented its share of challenges as well. The engine was not ideally set up for a large open world or to have hundreds of enemies on screen simultaneously, two core elements of the Dead Rising series up until this point. To get around this, it was decided that the game would go over quote, semi-open world similar to the first two games, and zombies that were fewer in number, but much stronger and more intimidating. Combat at this stage focused mostly on tense encounters in tight, intimate spaces. Environments were planned to be far more detailed, including a high number of interactive props in sharp contrast to Dead Rising 4. It was also around this time when concepts for a story began to take shape. Much like how Dead Rising 4 brought back Frank West as a playable character, another returning fan favourite would have led this adventure, the protagonist of Dead Rising 2, Chuck Green. He would have been joined by his daughter Katie, who also so would have been playable. Set in the airs between Dead Rising 2 and 3, Dead Rising 5 would have taken place in Santa Catrina, Mexico, a fictional town inspired by the real-life city of Leon. Chuck once again finds himself in search of Zombrex, the drug that temporarily staves off the zombie virus for his still-infected daughter Katie. In a plot inspired by the movie Sicario, a Mexican drug cartel has cornered the Zombrex market and has promised them a supply of it in return for their completion of various tasks. The virus begins to sweep the festively decorated town, which soon becomes overrun with costumed zombies. The Greens must find a way to retrieve their score of Zombrex while negotiating yet another outbreak. Initial plans for the game outlined a co-op option in which the whole game could be played by two people, one controlling Chuck and the other Katie, each with their own unique movesets. Chuck was intended to be a brawler type character with melee attacks that packed a punch, and the exclusive ability to combine weapons and items due to his mechanical expertise. Katie, meanwhile, was more agile and had powers stemming from the long-term presence of the zombie virus in her system. In some prototypes, for instance, she could telepathically compel hordes of zombies to go after human enemies from a distance. She was also intended to be portrayed as a tech-savvy teenager who could hack into devices using her mobile phone. The art direction for Dead Rising 5 was intended to be colourful and vibrant 
Imprint, consciously breaking away from the greys of its fellow sequels. Early work on Dead Rising 5 has been described as fairly harmonious and experimental, but the project would lose some focus when its design lead departed the company in November 2015 to pursue other opportunities. It would continue to flirt with various ideas, including using Chuck's motorcycle as a means of traversal. This was eventually scrapped when the developers couldn't find a place for it in its smaller environments. By all indications, Capcom Japan had expressed their approval of the project at this early stage, but its creative direction was about to undergo its first major shakeup. Its initial angle of Last of Us inspired combat in a moderately sized open world sandbox would shift somewhat when creative control of the project was assumed by an ex Ubisoft developer in April 2016. Under this new design director, the original concept of allowing players to graft any combination of items together was done away with. As opposed to letting players combine anything for the sake of it, a more traditional approach of having bespoke designs for combo weapons was taken. This was intended to allow players to more easily choose a combo based upon which situation they were facing. Around this time, the project head added in the ability to climb buildings and other structures. This new means of traversal reportedly divided opinion among some members of the team. Whereas some welcomed the new element of verticality, others were less convinced. A former Capcom designer gave their take on the matter. The climbing was pointless because why would you want to build a system that gets you away from the zombies? Sources say the game's new design director, whose resume included the Assassin's Creed series, endeavoured to widen the scope of the game's world, pushing for a larger map with more freedom to explore. They also introduced a focus on giving the player multiple different ways to approach each combat scenario, citing Far Cry 3's outposts as an inspiration. As 2016 came to an end and Dead Rising 4 was eventually completed, the scope of Dead Rising 5's development began to expand as staff from it transitioned over to this next project. Other developers, meanwhile, were planning pitches for games to be potentially made alongside the next Dead Rising. Having previously proposed brand new IPs, then revivals of existing ones, Capcom Vancouver would now split the difference, attempting reimaginings of legacy Capcom properties. The most radical of these, undoubtedly, was the tentatively titled Lost Star, a sci-fi revival of the 1985 scrolling shooter Gunsmoke. Originally western themed, Gunsmoke was overhauled into a team based open world shooter set in outer space. Likened to Guardians of the Galaxy and Cowboy Bebop by some, the title would have seen players exploring multiple planets, enlisting new crewmates to join their bounty hunting exploits. Another of these was codenamed Broken Horizon, which was a reboot of third person shooter Lost Planet built around four player co op. Players would have explored vast landscapes using mech suits, battling gigantic creatures, gathering resources to survive, and protecting your base from hostile threats like bandits was key. These two proposals never made it beyond the pitching phase, when in early 2017, Capcom rejected both. The ambitious Lost Star was branded well beyond the production capabilities of the studio, given that it would have required hundreds of employees and several years to develop. Capcom was also unwilling to invest in a big budget reboot of a relatively niche franchise in Broken Horizon. There was one revival pitch that was able to receive the initial green light, however. Another team had envisioned a third person shooter that was initially based around ghosts and goblins. This game, codenamed Panther, was planned to be a linear story driven affair set in a 1970s New York City where classical supernatural creatures like demons and werewolves are an everyday fact of life. Life. The player would have controlled a female law enforcer who battles supernatural entities as part of a government organization named the Knights of Aegis. The politically charged plot would have featured a racial allegory at its center, where the main character would have grown skeptical of the Aegis group's treatment of supernatural entities and found their allegiances in doubt. Partway into the game, they would have eventually unraveled that they too are in fact a golem, one of the supernatural beings they have been killing throughout the game, in a plot twist that flips the dynamics of the story on their head. 
Over months of pre-production in 2017, the game would develop elaborate ideas like these for its narrative and a prototype to showcase its gameplay built in Unreal Engine 4. It was a third-person shooter with a mix of realistic guns and magic spells that could be used to manipulate your environment. Players could shoot sewer grates or loose pipes to conjure large geysers of water, propelling themselves into the air to glide about and target enemies behind cover. With Panther and Dead Rising 5 simmering in the background, Capcom Vancouver was also working on downloadable content for Dead Rising 4 and attempting to grapple with the mixed reception of the base game. Former workers recall a viral video which criticised the game being the subject of much discussion in the post-launch period. The video by YouTube user Crobcat scrutinised the game's lack of detail and missing features, negatively contrasting it with the decade-old original Dead Rising. Capcom Vancouver was keenly aware of the video and planned to address as many of its complaints as they could alongside work on DLC. One ex-staffer put it thusly, we knew we released a shitty product and tried to do anything we could with our large technical limitations. Adding in some polish was essential for trying to get any sales on PS4. Crobcat's video had proven so influential, sources say, that the developers even recreated a shot from it for a trailer announcing fan-requested improvements. 2017 brought plenty of changes to Dead Rising 5 as well. Its original ambitions of building the game around two-player co-op were abandoned, and the team began exploring ways for the single player to switch between Chuck and Katie during gameplay. Players were intended to weigh up the strategic options presented by each of their unique playstyles as they approached new situations. At this stage in development, a number of features missing from Dead Rising 4 were set to return, such as the day and night cycle and psychopaths. These boss fights would have included a luchador who players would have fought in a wrestling arena. Sources claimed there had been extensive considerations towards reintroducing the timer from previous games, but before any final decision could be made, the project underwent another large change in direction. In April 2017, after a series of heated creative disagreements with the studio's management, the game's design director and lead designer were fired from the company in quick succession. This left Dead Rising 5 with only its executive staff to lead it, who soon opted to overhaul the entire project once more. With the studio's lack of Unreal Engine experience in mind, the decision was made to curtail Dead Rising 5's scope, transforming it from an open-world game to one with a linear level-based structure. Some staff members recounted their frustration at months of work going to waste, and the project's apparent lack of direction at this time. We'd ask what kind of game we were making, and the executive producer would say, our pillars of reference are other games that do companion AI, or character flipping, so our pillars are in Charted 4, Batman Arkham Knight, and Grand Theft Auto 5. This drove me insane. Not only do these games play completely differently, and are on their fourth plus iteration of working on the same engine slash tech slash mechanics, but the way these games do character swap is entirely different per game. The game's levels at this point in development have been likened primarily to those of Uncharted 4 due to their partly open nature and elements of exploration. This phase of the project lasted ultimately only a few months, however. Before the dust could settle on this latest iteration, it would undergo its most drastic shift yet in summer 2017. The team's remaining executives chose to reconfigure what had already been built into an action game heavily inspired by Dark Souls and Bloodborne. With the core premise of a Chuck and Katie adventure in Mexico intact, gameplay was altered considerably. A stamina meter and lock-on system were added, combat now required you to carefully evade oncoming attacks, waiting for an opening. Standard, run-of-the-mill zombies became less of a focus, as the game added a number of challenging new zombie variants themed around the Day of the Dead, including a large woman wielding a scythe dressed as Santa Muerte. In June 2017, the company hired Mexican horror film director Gigi Sol Guerrero, who joined the game's team of writers. Guerrero was also intended to play one of its characters. Sources indicate that over the following months, a first pass of the script was completed, and work had started on performance capture for the game's cinematics. It was planned to feature a renewed focus on the lore from the first two games, and multiple endings. Towards the end of the year, an external localization company in Mexico was hired to help flesh out the game's world. 
an entire telenovela was written alongside TV news reports charting the progress of the zombie outbreak entirely in Spanish that could be heard throughout the story. Some voiced their approval of this more linear design approach that attempted to play to the strengths of Unreal Engine 4. One interested party was Sony, who had reportedly shown enthusiasm for it in meetings with Capcom Vancouver. Unlike the previous two games, Dead Rising 5 had no timed exclusivity arrangement for the Xbox One and was therefore set to land on PS4 as well. Ultimately though, this vision for the game didn't last, as Capcom Vancouver's new staff had unwittingly repeated the mistakes of their predecessors. Much in the way that Climber did several years earlier, this Bloodborne inspired reinvention of the series drifted too far afield of what Capcom was willing to do with the Dead Rising IP. It was roundly rejected by the company's higher-ups in early 2018, who were once again bemused to find an alternate take on their franchise that they hadn't ever requested. Sources claimed the Vancouver heads had again failed to communicate their plans to Capcom Japan, who was firmly opposed to producing a Souls-like on a financial basis and felt that it didn't fit the series. The team was sent back to the drawing board yet again, and the studio felt serious ramifications as a result. In February 2018, the entire Vancouver branch was restructured around the singular goal of delivering the next Dead Rising game. All other undertakings fell by the wayside. Shortly before its team hoped to make the jump to full production, Project Panther was cancelled abruptly. A handful of its staff were reassigned to work on Dead Rising 5, and the remainder were laid off, alongside a multitude of other employees who were deemed non-essential. Overall, the layoffs affected 30% of the studio, just shy of 50 workers. In the aftermath of this restructuring, Vancouver's mobile reboot of Puzzle Fighter was axed in April 2018. This pet project of theirs, worked on by a small team, had launched only six months prior. Plans for further expansions and a port to consoles, including Nintendo Switch, were scrapped. The executive staff in charge of Dead Rising 5's Dark Souls phase were fired also. Replacing them were figures like Bryce Cochran, the executive producer of Dead Rising 4. Under this new leadership, the game adopted a more traditional style of gameplay, evolving into something more akin to Dead Rising 3 and 4. The team now aimed for a 2019 release, having been granted numerous extensions from Capcom. With its failures mounting, Capcom Vancouver found itself struggling to justify its existence. Attempts were briefly made to retrofit Project Panther into a multiplayer game, which was shot down by the Japanese head office. Six months on from their initial layoffs, Capcom Japan chose to cut their losses and close the entire studio, leaving 158 people out of work in September 2018. After over three years spent floundering in development hell, bouncing off one completely different creative direction after another, Dead Rising 5 was no more. Its final team of execs had been unable to convince them of its potential. Ex-employees blame a lack of leadership and the absence of a strong creative direction. Its failure spelled not only the demise of the studio in charge of it, but the series in general. Sources claim that despite Dead Rising 4 exceeding 1 million units sold, it didn't come anywhere close to breaking even. As for Dead Rising 5, it was similarly expensive. In 2018, Capcom disclosed to their investors that approximately 40 million US dollars was sunk into cancelled Vancouver projects, and former staff claim that almost all of that was spent on Dead Rising 5. In spite of the studio closure costing them their jobs, many of the developers I spoke with understood Capcom's decision. Capcom Vancouver had clearly shown that they were not capable of shipping a game well. DR3 was only shipped by the grace of Microsoft, DR4 was a mess, and DR5 was shaping up to be the same. The people on the ground floor were amazing, and they worked wonders, but the entire executive staff cycled constantly, and they still kept making the same mistakes that the previous staff had made. Another developer offered their perspective. DR5 was supposed to be a reset. New engine, new way of doing things, but in the end we couldn't figure it out. Their entire organisation was rudderless and unsure about where to bring the franchise. In the end, they ran out of time as Capcom ran out of patience. Many of Capcom Vancouver's employees found work at other major studios in the city, namely EA Vancouver and The Coalition. Its closure marked the end of the publisher's attempts to produce big budget games in North America. In November 2018, they asserted their intentions to concentrate the development of major titles in Japan from then on. 
For more content like this, please don't forget to subscribe. If you want to support my research, feel free to back me on Patreon like these kind people did. I've been Liam, and I hope you'll join me for another Game History Secrets.